I'd like to start now. Thank you. Welcome. You know, we've been um, <clears throat> talking quite a lot all afternoon, so I have a very croaky voice. Uh, fortunately for me, and maybe for you also, I don't have to say much, other than to introduce our speaker. And um, <clears throat> this is um, Michael Smith Masses. Um, Michael is a graduate of our um, SED, Sustainable Environmental Design, MSC, which um, he completed in 2008. He then went back home to Costa Rica and founded his own practice, Entrenos Atelier. Entrenos Atelier is a now an award-winning practice, I need my notes to remember the awards. The Young Architects in Latin America Award, uh, the Buenos Aires Biennale of Architecture, International Architecture Award, then uh, two Comadera Prizes in Costa Rica, Comadera Timber Design in 2014 and 2016, and the Sustainable Construction Award in Costa Rica in 2005. Um, and I think uh, Michael Wrightley is now taking a year of practice and has gone to Harvard where he's currently a low uh, fellow at the Graduate School of Design. So please welcome uh, Michael smith Masses. Hear me well in the back? 
Yeah, perfect, awesome. Well, it's, I feel so grateful to be here. Um, grateful with Simos and Jorge to consider me to be part of, of this event today and to share with you the, the projects we do back in Central America. I, and uh, I don't know, this place is amazing. I was here like almost 12 years ago and I remember the first time I entered that hallway and then we came here to the lecture hall and I remember was well, not Simos but Sirius Janas. He was very serious to us and, 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 and he was, oh my God, that was intimidating when all our colleagues, I think we thought the same way but then afterwards that year was truly transformative for most of us and I want to dedicate this little talk to my friends back in those days. Uh, it was an amazing uh, life experience. and. Uh, Something else I want to say, last Saturday I came to the AA, it was fully empty, and something I realized about this uh, fine institution is that when you see it empty, it's quite small, it's quite compact premises, you know? When, what it really makes this place amazing is, is, is the people and for the people. And I think uh, something that was really challengeful and amazing about this program, SED, is that the core value lays, lays within the people, within wellness, within this humanistic approach about comfort, about how you have different notions in terms of technical, but also emotional and physiological aspects about human beings and the built environment, which in a way for me, it gave me a lot of tools when I went back home, as Simos pointed out, uh, we found it with my associate, our own practice, and it's based on that. And what I wanted to share with you is this architecture as an excuse, uh, an excuse to do things, to work with the people and for the people. And um, I come from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is this small Central American country. It's a paradise. We abolished the army in the 1940s, so that money that is badly spent by other countries in the third world uh, in weapons and military, we spend it in health and education. So it's a wonderful paradise. You're more than welcome to come and have a beer and surf. It's, it's beautiful. And I keep inviting Simos all the time to come over. Jorge has been in, in Costa Rica and he, I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I'm saying the truth right now. It's a very beautiful country. <laughs> and uh, this is my associate, Alejandro Vallejo, and I, Mike. Uh, we founded our practice, but I truly believe that I, I am the voice here of different people, community leaders, colleagues, emerging small collectives, students, activists. I think there is a strong Latin American movement right now of different offices that we work and deal with the same issues. And I think we all believe in making things. Even each collective has different approach about how to deal with the practice. I truly believe, we believe in making. But there is one big question, why it matters to make things. Even Batman loses patience with global urban spatial ideologies. I got this image from uh, in the GSD from Neil Brenner's uh, lecture about histories and theories of urban interventions, and Robin was telling Batman, for the first time in history, more than half uh, the world's population lives uh, on it. Shut up, Batman says, right? We all know this. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna show you that much data. We all know this, that uh, the world population is evident. But do we really know about this? Because these are the conversations we're having, in, we had in London like 10 to t uh, 12 years ago. We're having it now. We're having it in Cambridge as well, in Harvard and MIT. And something that, I'm gonna say it in very good French, something that really pisses me off, is this concept about the global north where they think they're the developers and the wealthy people, and then the global south uh, in and for need of development of the poor, we the poor, right? And what about, for example, the global central? I, I told this to Bruno Latour, have you, have you heard about Bruno Latour? He came to the, the GSD a few weeks ago and I told him about it, what about us? Did, I mean, there is a lot of people in the tropics, in the central part of the country, they don't even talk about us. And what about the global majority? Because, I mean, there is this polarization of north and south, but what happens with the most of the population in the world? It's not about north and south. And there are very important correlations between informality and poverty. We can talk and we can speak is that one billion of the population lives on the, or under the line of poverty. Two, two million lives from informal economies. 80% of the world population lives with less than $10 per day. 
I mean, if you show it in the, in the global north, uh, everybody is, is asking, what the heck, how can you manage to do that? But if you live in the global central and, or in the global majority, you know those $10, they expand and contract, and you cannot put a price to life quality. So there is a different response to that. I mean, you, can, you cannot buy life quality. Half of the population in Latin America lives under the line of poverty. The opposite, the opposite of, of poverty is in wealth, but justice, Brian Stevenson says in, in claims in this powerful statement. So we are talking now about global justice. Are we talking about inclusion and resource access? How do we assess this from a design perspective? Are we talking, are we developing projects? Are we dealing with this? Are we doing relevant things? Are we work, working for the overall of the world population? Or are we just in our, in our own little bubbles thinking that that's the only thing that matters? In Latin America, at least, because I speak from where I live and I work, um, everybody keeps talking about the rural migration. And again, Batman is slapping Robin, right? I mean, since the 60s, the majority of the, of the population live in the cities. Thus, uh, and on the other hand, there are some, some amazing rural developments as well. So there is nothing about migration anymore. There is not a po poverty rising indeed. So it's not about showing the global south to be the poorest part of the world. It's not, it's not true at all. Actually, since 1995, half of the population has improved their life conditions. So we're talking about informal economies that we have to acknowledge and recognize these as a very important part of the urban fabrics. Um, there is a lack of affordable housing, yeah, but there is a lack of affordable urban housing. Are we building communities? We're, we're still thinking about building housing units. We're thinking about building communities. How did, how did this may happen? Do we have access to quality, access to design? Does the, most of the world population has access to designers? Or we're still thinking that we put everybody on the same box, everybody compacted, and we don't really care about incorporate all the necessities of the users, which is, makes sense, but it's not, not in real practice. Three-fourths of the housing has been built without any architects or urban planners, neither regulations. And this is not bad and good, it's just a phenomenon. It's not about taking a position, but it's to acknowledge. I mean, if you even go to vernacular architecture, it's amazing how these 500, 1,000 year buildings, they work perfectly today in terms of environmental performance. And it's not only a third world issue, you can see it in the US, London, Athens, Paris, Madrid, even in Boston, where I'm based right now, we're talking about it's almost 700,000 persons. So it's not about the numbers, it's about the people. And when you work in a one-on-one -on -one scale with the people, you understand the numbers has, are useless. Robert Neurith, in his book, Shadow Cities, he claims that one billion people, or one billion mixes more concrete than any other developer in the world. So basically, here is where the cities are being built and the cities of the future. Also, it's important to understand that the users and the environment are the true protagonists, not the designers. We just provide a service. Unfortunately, in most academia, we keep going through that 1% of the world population, investing all our efforts, energies, and tools to work for a particular segment that is, doesn't represent the, the overall of the world population. And we work, walk blindly towards this still. And we provide a service. And it's a shame because it happens in Costa Rica. I have seen it in different academias around the world that they basically, they put this idea, incept this idea on the students that you're gonna graduate, you're gonna put your office, your phone, and they're gonna call you to design an airport. And I mean, we know that's not gonna happen. And, and, and that's very important to understand. Uh, I respect different ways of, about people, how did they want to achieve their careers, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there are other options. And how about we think about providing a service and if you take it from the sustainable perspective in the overall approach from socio-economic, environmental, we work with this, with the social resource. And we truly believe in our practice that collaboration and participation develop a sense of ownership. Walking through the, hall, through the halls here in the AA, I saw this amazing poster about some talks. Uh, I don't know if they happen already or they're gonna happen, but this is a discussion we're doing in the GSD right now in Harvard. And actually, uh, we are organizing a symposium in March which is called informal means, and we're speaking about the same issues, means of developing a practice. Because today I'm gonna show you uh, some of our projects, you may like it or not, but uh, the, the important part is how do you sustain a practice? You're showing, you can show these amazing projects with social impact, but how do you manage to sustain your practice? Uh, because that's a big question after you graduated, right? And we 
with clients, with frameworks, sustain social business models. So rethinking the clients, forms of alliance, affording risk, uh, they're really fundamental issues that we as designers face in these days. I'm gonna tell you our story very quickly, very briefly. We have two types of projects, the one that fed us and the one that they, they don't. We started like this uh, 15 years ago. So the red dot is a fed, the white is not. So me, I came here to the, to the AA with a, with a grant, with a scholarship. Uh, my associate and I, we don't have family members that own enterprises, construction enterprises, nothing. I mean, we have to build our own pathway. So it was pretty amazing because when you graduated, you have this first commission to do that doggy house for your aunt, but that's cool. I mean, you have one project, you get paid for that one, so that, that, that's okay. But then what happens afterwards in the other side is that you knock doors with um, NGOs, public and private enterprises. I mean, can, be, can I be part of any initiative over there? And in a matter of 15 years, we have built up a network of possibilities to work along, and the projects that were not uh, getting money were getting money, and they overlapped it, and we have built a very powerful working frame in the last 15 years to sustain our practice. I will not lie to, and tell you that we have a lot of money and we have a big firm, it's still small. Actually, this is one of the questions I'm trying to work in this year in, in the GSD. But at least uh, these ways about pursuing projects, moving away from your comfort zone, and more important, that you don't need to get paid to do what you really love and you're passionate about it. Of course, the money is important to sustain a practice, but there is something that goes beyond. And even when you try to develop these projects, I mean, you can really get the funding easily for most of the projects. If you have a tremendous idea and you connect well with, and you manage to communicate and articulate these projects in an appropriate way with different stakeholders, it's possible to do whatever we want if we have it clear in that sense, the values that we pursue. I'm going to show to you, uh, in Costa Rica, there was a program a uh, time ago, like 10 years ago. It's called Redes de Cuido which was in like nurseries in rural and, and low income communities. We designed and we got commissioned by Holcim to design uh, guidelines for the nurseries. And um, again, this was by knocking doors, the, no contacts. We just knocked door, how can I help? And in, I actually remember I came back from the SED program afterwards and they knew I was an expert in, in the field. So they hired me and they knew I knew a little bit. So it was, it, it was helpful and then they, they commissioned us to design these guidelines. And we work also with the government and the former president in that, in that time, Laura Chinchilla, we, we gave her the, these design guidelines, which we basically work in, in four regimes. The case studies, we did regulations, try to integrate them because it was a totally a mess. Then we work with environmental design features for four climatic regions in Costa Rica and also the qualities of the spaces. And from these, we got um, different important uh, outputs in terms of how you organize the programmatic relationships, the orientations, the proportions, the transitional spaces. I still truly believe that in the tropics, uh, this is a very important feature in terms of architecture, how you make transitions and, and how you connect the spaces. And also in terms of the form and the space and, uh, and the proportions and uh, this very basic rule of thumbs about the depth of the spaces and how you deal with the envelope and how you enhance the, the use of cross ventilation under different c conditions. And we also explore, and this is part also of the research I did in the SED back in those days, having this parasol roof and this buffer, the thermal buffer space for multifunctional activities and how, how you can have the cross flows. And then after um, we got commissioned with these uh, design guidelines, we did this project uh, based on, on, on some of this. So at the beginning, they thought we were crazy about this space in particular, the top one, because they say it was useless, uh, just wide open space on the top. We explained to them it was a thermal buffer, it was multifunctional, and at the end it, it became quite, quite successful because one of the problems of this type of, of infrastructures in Latin America is that they're conceived only for one particular purpose. So 60% of the day is gonna be a nursery, I'm sorry, 60% of the week is gonna be a nursery, but what happens with the other 40%? So there is a tremendous, 
uh, opportunity to develop these as touch points for the community itself and to have capacitation workshops and many other activities. So at the end, they truly understood the, the importance of this. And this project was built in, a, in warm, uh, uh, I'm sorry, hot, dry conditions. And then also we made another one, but in a warm, humid climate in Hunt Creek, in the Caribbean side of our country. We worked with very, very rough and low budget materials. And especially the importance of this was relying mostly on the transitional spaces, the porosity of the envelope, how these spaces are articulated, how we have movable partitions in order to integrate the whole space if we want, if we wanted to. And these are some of the details, as you see, very, very simple architecture, but as we have follow up after the project was built, very useful for them in terms of the functionalities of it. And something important about these projects, as you may see, they're very basic, it's a very basic frame concrete structure which allow us, allow them, sorry, to uh, customize some of the panels in the different climatic conditions they will perform. So in this case, this was a, hy a hy hybrid between concrete and wood, laminated beams and uh, uh, timber beams, and uh, it was almost the same concept, and still, I, I think these are the same principles from the design guidelines, and we, we have built at least six of these centers, uh, and what the, the insights we have from the community members are very useful for us because they really appreciate it. These, these spaces that allows them to grow in time, to adapt, to be flexible, to change. Uh, this project probably is the most uh, important project we have in our office right now. It's called Cueva de Luz. I'm gonna show you a quick video here. This is located in San Jose's biggest informal settlement in the great metropolitan area. It's called La Carpio. Cueva de Luz means the cave of light. Almost uh, 50,000 persons uh, who live in people who live in this community. We were changing the roof there, so we some work. <laughs> So La Carpio, as I told you, is 50,000 inhabitants. Uh, this place is, is very powerful. We have learned so much from this community, and especially from these two ladies, these powerful, crazy two ladies, Alicia and Maris. Alicia is a community leader. Maris is the, the leader and the founding of the organization, CIFIS. They invented this program, it's called System of Art Education for Social Inclusion. So eight years ago, we knocked the door, how can we help? Uh, and we helped them to develop the infrastructure. And it was amazing because Alicia, uh, Maris asked Alicia, what can we do in here eight years ago? And Alicia told, told her, hey, how about our, our, our an orchestra, a symphonic orchestra? Okay, let's go for it. And these two crazy ones, they, they did it. They managed to, to have an, an amazing, a terrific project, very embedded and grassrooted with the community. For example, Willy Robles, and I, I mean, you can uh, reach to this in the media from the community. Since the beginning, there was some traces of engagement and empowerment and hope. The project was coming up and there was a lot of positive uh, messages and images. And in a matter of years, they have more than 150 volunteers. The investment has stopped $1 million to, to develop from public and private efforts, which is like one of the greatest challenges in Latin America is how you can get the public and the private to work together. The Carpius Orchestra performed in the National Theater, which is like a great, great honor. And it impacts more than 900 persons within the community. And even the, the kids that uh, train judo in the community, they won a gold medal in the national <coughs> games in Costa Rica. So these are some examples about the, the, the greatness of this community and their fights and their struggle and how their, their voices are building up in this frame. It's located in that, the Cueva del Sapo, which means the toad, toad Cave. 
probably used to be called by the, the most dangerous site in San Jose where drugs, killing was a very bad place to be, at least from the consumption media. But uh, what happened afterwards is called the Cave of Light. And uh, the concept of the project that we worked together was a prog progressive change based in urban acupunctures. And uh, that's more or less how it's situated and it has like three, three stages. I'm gonna show you uh, the couple, the other two in a while. And uh, it was, it's a very, very simple project, open floor plan because you have a limited plot, density to achieve in order to have and to host these activities that were very important for, for the community. Um, the concept of the project is, is laminated timber frames in a sequence, and then you have all these uh, elements that uh, provided the, the, the environmental, the clima climatic responsive uh, design uh, in to some extent. Uh, I can just resume this in these two drawings. I think they, they talk about, we use, I mean, the, the wood structure is everything, and everything has to fit in that because of the density and the limitations and the budget. So what we managed to do is, there is this wonderful book, it's called Climate Responsive Design by Richard Hyde, and he says that one of the biggest problems in the tropics is that we try to solve everything with, with one opening. And we need to have different openings for different things, for the visuals, for the ventilation, for the illumination. That's something very keen and important to do. So in that sense, we, we try to explore with the envelope. And I wish you can come over it because it really performs well. We have very well cross ventilation. The environment is so comfortable and it's based only in these principles of having porosity, then having this uh, element that provides adequate protection from rain rainwater, but allows the penetration of, uh, in these cases, direct solar radiation, but, and also there is a, a sky component, very important, but allows, allow us to have the, just the enough amount of uh, daylight for, for the space. And these columns, because of the sequence of the frameworks, these columns help us to have like little chimneys in, in a way, I mean, we don't need the, the, the adiabatic effect that much, but at least it help us to have these like a mem membranes that helps you to, to move and work along with the airflows. This is a picture of the process of the construction process. And this is uh, partly the final outcome. And this, there's a, um, I, I like to, t to, t to tell this uh, anecdote because, I mean, this project has won very important awards. In, in the last one was in the Venice Binali in the a Young Architects Award in a collateral event. Uh, and we uh, won in the, um, in the Costa Rican Binali as well, the, the first prize and the international prize. But something silly about this is that, uh, for example, we, we won this prize, a colleague from Costa Rica, he called to the College of Architects and say, hey guys, how come this project won? How is it possible? It's illegal. So the, 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 the College of Architects, they call us and say, hey, guys, is that true? Is that, is that true? Yeah, of course it's true. I mean, it's, it, it's, what do you expect? It's in an informal settlement, I mean, for the sake. So uh, they, they tell us, okay, what can we do? Uh, in, in that afternoon, when we received the phone call, we sent to them all the technical documents, and in a matter of hours, was legal, the project. <laughs> so. <laughs> What, what is important to say about this anecdote is, is, is not that I'm promoting now illegal architecture, which sometimes it makes sense, but what I'm saying is that, of course, there was a lot of background from engineers, from the government, everybody was on board, but because it was illegal, they say yes, but we cannot sign anything. But at the end, everything came up together nicely. And I think the most important and relevant part about this is that if we still thinking about construction codes, if we're still thinking about all the restrictions, especially in Latin America, all the urban regulations are uh, misinterpretations or adaptations of the global north. Right, they don't really respond to the citizens. I mean, La Carpio has been struggling for 40 years to have a space like this. And we keep blaming these communities because they have thieves, they have drugs, and I mean, and nobody does anything. That's a very, you know, tension and very, a very strong thing to, to deal with. So as citizens, and, and truly I'm not talking up in, in the hat of an architect, I'm talking with the hat of a citizen. We got together, we put this together, and we're showing that there is another way to, to think the city to, to, that is more related and oriented with the communities and the necessities. So this is an emergent voice. 
is this a, if this is a good a way of solving the problem? I mean, go, go on site and talk to the people. And what happens that's very important is that this project was built and then finally, 50 years after, the government, they build a school close by, 50 years after. So this is a catalyst. So I, we, we truly believe that this type of acupunctures are very important in the sequence of working within informal settlements. And of course, I'm not speaking something new. This has been done since the, I mean, there is a wonderful work like Jorge Mario Jauregui from the 80s and in, in Rio, and, and there's a lot of great examples about this. But, and this is the, the images from before and after. We also participated in the fundraising. We have some of the beams and we imprinted uh, with CNC a grid so people can sign on it and donate some funds. So in a matter of two weekends, we managed to get $40,000. So this is an example about other means and ways to, to develop a practice and to develop a project. Uh, and the beams there, then afterwards, they were installed on, on the project. So it has like a, a print, an imprint from the people and everybody getting together. Another important thing to say is this is no architect's imposition. And you can tell this, the project was not even finished and you have everybody uh, using the project when there was no construction, of course, when it was safe as well. Uh, so this is not this, the greatness of the architect imposing their ideas within the urban fabric. This is about just trying to uh, work together and to um, have these spaces that are necessary for the community. These, not, these are not our inventions. They were needed, they were useful, and they, of course, they are grassrooted and appropriated within the users. And lately, in 2014, uh, Professor Tomás de Camino, he made, he made a maker's workshop over there, and then now Veritas University, where I work, they just managed to do a, a fab lab in La Carpio. So they have all the 3D printers, and they have amazing tools over there. Uh, I heard the community is doing a terrific uh, work with this, like really, get, really getting into digital fabrication. Uh, there is also a tailoring entrepreneurship, which is called Entre Costuras. There is also breakdance classes, there is music ensembles, um, there is jazz, rock, uh, you name it. There is a lot of things happening in there, pretty amazing judo, karate, kyokushin. Uh, we even I teach a class back in Costa Rica and we work on site with the community to address uh, further steps and, and different possibilities working along La Carpio. Uh, this is the tallest uh, wood construction um, we're talking about laminated timber in terms of a structure. So that, that's, for us, is a challenge. Uh, now we're facing also, we, we also have back home in Trenos, but with other associates, we have a wood construction enterprise, and we are getting into the, the laminated timber work, but also with the cross-laminated frames. And yeah, this is a tremendous opportunity to push forward further these type of typologies and projects and densities. And I mean, I can, we can even have another lecture just talking about the benefits of wood, which are, th there is plenty of them uh, as a construction material. But there is also, the, uh, there's a quality paradigm uh, with this type of construction. We have the best engineer in our country, which his name is Juan Tuk. He's been 40 years around. He wrote the, the code, construction codes for, for Central America and Costa Rica in terms of wood. He set the standards and he worked with us. And something very important about these type of projects is usually the government, if they do these type of projects, they, ha they want it to be generic and cheap and has to be the opposite way around. You have to have the best quality people involved to have, I mean, they just want to do cheap stuff and this is not helping at all. So, I mean, there are amazing examples, good and bad examples, for example, in Medellin and in Colombia about these uh, situations and conditions. There are some pending operations. The project um, is not finished yet. There are some things that we're still struggling. I'm gonna tell, tell you a little bit about later. Um, there is this conciliation. I told you about the, about the public and the private efforts. And uh, yeah, there's some, some of the transitional spaces. I, it, it, this, I really, I'm really in love with this uh, part of the project because you can tell how the users, they really appropriate it. They put the plants, the, the environment, and all the workshops and all the things. The project has a, a patina. How do I say patina in English? Patina, like a, 
Parina, like uh, the aging, there is like an aging of the building, which my associate, when they told me, oh my, the building is looking quite old right now. But uh, it's not getting old, it's getting mature, you know, it's getting response from the community, it's being used. And I think there is a very nice part about how the projects get, get into age, and they're like uh, thought as open operations, flexible to adapt to the user's conditions. Um, there was another uh, important prize we, we won the mention in the Ibero-American Design Biennale in Madrid in interior design, and we, we're not interior designers. We just send the pictures, and it was, it's about the wood. And I'm telling this about the awards not because I want to, to brag, I really don't care about that. I'm saying this because, I mean, there, I'm gonna show you another project later on that uh, this is being done by the community. I, I, I'm not speaking about Entre Nos and myself, I'm speaking about a group of people that we feel very proud about what we have achieved collectively together in participation. And I think that there is, that's very important. And I think this last picture from Cueva de Luz is, is powerful for us because there is a paradigm uh, about conciliation efforts, but, and this picture resumes everybody, resumes private enter, enterprise owners, community leaders, community members, NGOs, us, the government, even uh, the Costa Rican former president is in there. He used to be the Ministry of uh, Social Welfare in that, in that moment, and now he's the president of Costa Rica, but we need to know about that. And, and it's pretty amazing because it, it is really about getting connected, getting the stakeholders, get everybody on board, work together. That's where the real synergy occurs and makes these projects to roll on and, and happen. Then after this project, we have other interventions within the, 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 pl the place. One is called uh, Brisas de, de Luz. How am I doing with time, Simus? Do I have time? Yeah? Because okay. I got 40 minutes here, but I have, yeah, it's been 40 minutes already? No, oh, okay. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, this is Brisas de Luz. It's another project. Uh, we're working in La Carpio. This is a multi-programmatic um, uh, project with a skate park. Uh, MIT is going to be a workshop, and then the, the um, sports facilities, and, and there is a roof garden. And uh, I mean, these projects, usually you have to think it in phases because you don't know if you're going to have the funding for building the whole thing. So usually we think in phases in that sense, and we're trying to get Uber and the government to work together and finance this project. The other one is called Cuadra de Luz, which is a bigger question in, on site. And one of the biggest questions in informal settlements is, how to release a space without harming communities. And uh, I mean, there's no space. If you want to do the, the, the public space, the gathering spaces, there, there is none, there's, there's a lack of this. So we, we knew some important things. First of all, the street is the, the common public space. We did this project, so there is a lot of trust. The trust probably is the most important part. I think building trust, observe, and listening are three important skills that we need to, to, to conceive. And then the, the finally, uh, we have these discussions with the community about a housing density project. And we came out with this strategy, which means that, okay, we got the plot where we have Cueva Luz, we might be able to work in here. There are some vulnerable families that live in these very critical conditions over there. So how about we get them together? We have an, a possibility close to the Carpio to use a temporary plot to make a, a camp where the families can stay there for a few months and we can make like a capacitation to build and strengthen community capacities within. And then we can open the plot and we can uh, incorporate mid-density solutions, which later on will allow to provide housing for the families and then other ones they can be on board. And then afterwards we can speculate to have more or less this type of uh, solutions. Uh, so we work on this and we incorporated, tried to be more, the more off the grid as possible with water in terms of bio ponds, ur urban gardens, and different solutions that we work with our engineers to, to develop um, all the sustainable solutions in terms, in terms of water management, also in terms of energy with biodigesters, uh, solars, Costa Rica, I don't know if you know, but we managed to almost perform the whole year without any uh, CO2 emissions. We, we have all, all renewable energy, basically. So I think this is something very well developed back, back home. Also, 
uh, these public spaces are so important in the way you address the first level to connect and interconnect all these spaces for different events and uh, the collective agenda. And uh, finally, but not later, all the, um, the principles that uh, have the passive design techniques and strategies in order to achieve these. And well, this is a rough uh, image from this project. The other thing that is happening, this is more coming soon than the other one, is called Cueva de Luz as a compound. What, what happens is that still the project achieve to, to deal with 900 persons, but we need to build up more capacity. So the capacity is being built. First of all, we need to finish the balconies. We haven't finished that one, and they're very important for the performance of the building. Also, we are doing a water tank to make a water tank treatment of the disposable water. We, they really need, this urgent to have this space, which is like a, a sports facility and a veranda to protect this little plaza they have. And they want to rethink the, the boundary to claim a, a bit better this public space, uh, as a, not public, semi-public space. So we're working on this right now. And also, some of the questions that are coming along is some of the families that are really involved and engaged with the project, how about we interconnect the project with some of the surrounding housing pro uh, houses uh, from, from the project? So in this case, one of these houses, they rented for, they rent the rooms for different families. So we managed to talk to them and they say, okay, if we manage to do a density propose, proposal and liberate the space a little bit, that could be something that we can work along together. So we came out with this idea about doing one plot as an example to liberate the space, to provide density, uh, to generate this uh, green and landscape regeneration and water treatment because all the water goes directly and, and contaminated. So this could be like a one pattern that can be replied in, into the, in the margins of the river. And this is La Carpio, and this, is, this problem is, is something that we are doing with the housing ministry right now in Costa Rica, rethinking the border and how we can provide density along this border and, and how to walk and move along with these proposals. So this is something we're keen about exploring and hopefully we can manage to this year uh, to, to put one of these prototypes on site as a showing example because I mean, this is not about master planning. This is more about being strategic and try to do this sequence of interventions in order to the community also to understand and have feedback and, and grow along the process with this. And uh, these are some of the prototypes we were trying to develop and different structures, different structure possibilities. And, uh, and then afterwards, this is one project that we already have the plans and we're just getting the funding in these months. Is, is on the back to build capacity. It's called Tower Tree. And this is providing a little bit more of density because there is a lot of necessity for, especially for the elderly and the young ones uh, to le develop a Montessori, a daycare center. So these are uh, very immediate necessities, at least that we can solve and cover to see what are the, the steps to follow. So it's quite a complex environment, but I mean, we have been there for more than 12, no, what is it? No, yeah, like 10 years, 10, 10 to nine years there. So it's an, it's an amazing place to be. We believe in this, we believe in inclusive design. We don't do any render model or, or a sketch before getting a, engage and on board with our clients, with our customers, with our, our communities. Uh, we work together in participatory design processes. And I don't know, have you ever experienced this? But there is a wonderful lessons that they go beyond academia. We were talking today about uh, in the um, SCD reviews, uh, I was pulling the idea that maybe there is a great exploration between participatory design articulated with sustainable environmental design agendas. They, these, these, these two, they can underpin, they can collide and do amazing stuff because it's putting the users as a user-centered design approach in how to debate and how to speculate, but also how to build possible occupational patterns and scenarios within the built environment. And of course, you get, uh, if you get people on board, they really empower, they really think this belongs to them. And it's an amazing experience, a transformative experience, at least for myself in the last years, what we have learned from different communities. I just spent the last uh, three weeks in Mexico. We went to work in a rural community in, in close to Guadalajara. 
uh, and it was a tremendous experience. And this is what we get. Uh, I mean, it's not about having all these funky drawings with the community, of course. It's about raising voices and everybody feels comfortable and safe to, to give an opinion. And it's very important to be clear that we are the, the technical, the facilitators, and we are gonna get this information, we're gonna process it, we're gonna do design patterns, we're gonna do design guidelines, we're gonna organize the space, and then we can uh, put this into a, a specific context, and then we go back to the community and do a validation process. We present our ideas. And we have done this a lot of times, and how many times you have to present to the client all the times you need until you get an approval. The good thing from us is we present it and they say yes, but this is not rocket science, this is not the NASA, of course. If you get their clients on board, you, you will, they will trust you. They will say, okay, no, no we, we agree, we might change this a little bit and that and that, but th th this is a very important part, get people on board. And this project we did in, it's called Capaclahui, in an indigenous community in Costa Rica. We work in, with the same tools, we work with the community uh, participatory design process. We have uh, translators for the Cabecar uh, uh, dialect. And uh, it was a very, very simple linear project w where they wanted to have a community shelter, a, a library, and having like a place to sleep over. Uh, because most of the indigenous communities, they go there, they sleep, and then the, the day after they go to the closest, biggest town. So it's like a transitional part in their journey. And same uh, design elements, as I show you in other projects, is about the frames, is about the elements that help us to give this articulation. The community make, make to us very clear their cosmovision in terms of inframundo, supramundo, upper, lower world, and how is it connected, everything flows, the energy flows, and is connected with the environment and with the external conditions. And this is in a rural area that is probably four hours ride from the San Jose, the capital. And uh, there, there is also a sense of proudness. This project has also won very important awards, especially in Latin America. And uh, I mean, the community feels very proud. We, we, we thought it together. Um, and as you can say, uh, see, I'm sorry, is a porous envelope with these transitional, uh, transitional spaces. I have to admit that we have some failures here it's in terms of the overhangs. We, we became quite short with, with them. We have to extend it, especially these ones, uh, but they're fixed now already. And um, as I told you, this cosmovision of the indigenous a way of thinking and living the spaces with the infra and the supra worlds. And we got, I mean, most of these projects, we, we got engaged afterwards. There is a post occupancy engagement for sure. I think that's one of the most important parts because designers, they love to show the pictures of the project when it's finished. Uh, please d don't get the users in. Let me, uh, let, me, let me hire some fancy furniture, take these amazing pictures, and then you get it, and that's it. I mean, that, that's silly. The most important and critical part is what happens afterwards, and how the, the space is being used. And there is a lot of uh, successes, but also failures, and it's wonderful to learn about this, about this notion that these are open operations, that they're flexible, they're adaptable, then we don't have the solutions for everything. We have to be humble in that way that we can, every time we can improve. I, I was looking into the Renzo Piano exhibition in the National Gallery and he was talking about this endless way for seeking of beauty uh, as a driven force. And I, I think uh, even rather th than, than beauty, I think this is our, it's a human, truly a human behavior about this never ending way of the way we live and we interact with things, which I think uh, we have learned a lot from, from our projects. And we even made a collective to get books in the library. We got engaged with that operation as well. Um, in 2015, we got invited to Venezuela to work in Espacios de Paz. I don't know if you have heard about this initiative. It was very powerful. They did two editions, 2013 and 15. As you may know, Venezuela is very harsh condition right now. It's, it's quite complex. I have been there three times. This time we work in a community it's called Cojedes, and we work with 60, 60 to 70 community members to rethink this space. 
it was no, this was nobody's land. It was a place where they have uh, violations, they have a lot of troubles, drugs, and so on and so forth. And they wanted to refurbish this space. And there was a set of operations that they told us that we might pursue. The first one, please close the freaking roof. <laughs> they, they have like, the, the, I don't know who projected this building in the tropics, but truly the, he, he didn't have any notion. And especially in the way you deal with water and, and solar radiation. So they, the community told us the first priority is please close the roof. Then secondly, we have a Berlin wall. Uh, let's open it up to the community so we can see what happens inside. Also, uh, the programming within the, the, the how you call that in English? The, Staircases, the benches, benches, right? Uh, graderia, yeah, yeah. The sitting area. The sitting area. <laughs> okay. In the in the sitting area, uh, of course, underneath that, there is a lot of opportunity to develop that space and put program on it. So, social productive activities, sports facilities, community spaces, education, restrooms. Also, we thought about this monothematic way of dealing with the pitch. We managed to think with the community, how about we put stripes and we divide it with nets and colors to have different activities at the same time. Solar radiation in pinch was an, was an issue for sure. We needed to have some protection. How to deal with the public uh, spaces along and probably some other uh, elements that will be keen to have the adequate environmental performance for the building. And since it's quite high, how about we incorporate, incorporate other spaces? And this was some of the images we showed to the community. We arrived <coughs> in the evening, we did the participatory design workshop. The day, the day after, we showed these images. And in the evening, we went to the warehouse to buy all the materials, and we executed this project in a matter of uh, one month and a half. So it was truly, truly a challenge. But we got all the community on board. and. Um, uh, most of the, the for the, for example, we we have the biggest project in terms of a scale, but we have the same budget. So it was a, truly a challenge. So these are uh, some recycled beams from some social housing units uh, donated by Uruguay in the 90s. Nobody used them these beams, so we put it into the facade, recycled them in order to incorporate these uh, overhangs to cut the solar radiation and. Uh, most of the design decisions, of course, we, we build it and we work it with the community. And I think something I appreciate a lot about these images is that these pictures have been taken by the community. You can go to La Techada in Facebook and they keep posting pictures because they, this really belongs to them and they're really empowered and there is a lot of activities. And I heard from all the interventions in Espacio de Paz, which probably I'm talking about 15 interventions in all the country. This is probably in the top three interventions, not because of the architecture itself, but because of the use and uh, belongness to the community in that, in that sense. And uh, as you can tell, I mean, these images, they really show about the people and for the people. We are currently trying to develop a project in Guatemala. We're working in, in uh, Limona. Oh, we got a Guatemala, yeah, there you go, in the house. Uh, 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 Guatemala has this informal settlement, it's called La Limona, which is Central America's biggest informal settlement. I'm gonna show you. So we did a workshop like a year ago, and we work in, uh, in La Limona. This place used to be still a little bit quite harsh in terms of gangs and uh, maras. I don't know, have you heard about the maras? But it's, qu it's quite, they face very tremendous challenges because of the maras, but before, because of the social exclusion. Uh, I mean, it's a very conflictive area, but with a lot of opportunities, with a lot of great people. And we got with another collective, Para Todos from Guatemala, we worked together. We went to the community and we did a participatory design uh, process with some community leaders and members to develop this part of the, of the settlement. I mean, they, they don't have a space, basically. But they have this little community center and this uh, risco. Uh, it looks like a quarry almost. So we wanted to explore the possibility to provide a little bit of density in order to achieve a touch point, a place that the community can gather and has to and have different activities. And this is something is quite preliminary, but we work along together with, with them. 
just I'm about almost to finish. Uh, this is a project we want to commission in Costa Rica. We work it with our practice and USO architects. Uh, we want a commission from a municipality to develop some urban acupunctures. We already submitted all the plans and this, this is gonna be constructed this year. It's a bus terminal that articulates some of the segments with, within the urban fabric and some other little interventions. Same methodologies, same ways of thinking and practicing. And then uh, this is what is gonna be built, built first, the, the bus terminal. And then we have these uh, acupunctures in different places. Uh, there is a little vertical garden uh, placed uh, like a mirador, a, way, a place to see some sightseeing and a community center on top. And also we're working on the connections within the, the spaces. So this first one is still is the, all these open platforms that uh, allow the touch points and the people to, to be engaged and on board to, to these places. And for example, this is the vertical garden which is located in that area. And more or less, this is the, the, the vision is quite simple. It's just trying to fit within the geomorphology of the site and having a multifunctional possibilities and to activate these abandoned spaces. And also, we are, this is very, very complex. We're working with the, all the staircases that connects these communities. So we're doing modular staircases in order to upgrade and try to, to enhance some of the public relationships along these spaces. So these are, a, this is a vision from the municipality and we participated in the competition, we won it. It's gonna be being built. Uh, I still have my questions about this, but I think the most important part is this upgrade has a sequence and is gonna be progressive and hopefully ha can, has, can have a lot of retroalimentation from the from the community itself. And just to finalize, I wanted to finally show you some of the projects we do back in the university. As, a, as in the studio, we, I direct with my associate Alejandro. It's called Entre Comunidad. And we work for, in several places, like in La Carpio, and, and these, these examples are, are, are quite nice. These, these, uh, the, our students, they work with this, um, I forgot her name, I think Maria, Doña Maria, they worked together to develop El Mercadito. So Doña Maria, she, she was selling in his front door, she was selling um, lens, uh, she was selling panties, bread, everything, all together in the, same, in the same window. So they work along together with her and try to do some branding to the facade. Or th there is Jelba, she has like, a, she was selling fruits and they work with Jelba, with the students to develop this, they call it Jelba Mobile, to, to have the fruits along the, the, the community. And I think these examples are, I, I like them because, I mean, some of them, they have worked with palettes, but this is no Instagram inspiration, of course, or, or Pinterest. Uh, this is because we tell our students, don't worry about the money because we don't have. So basically, yeah, I, I, love, I always love to say this because this is the, the, probably the core value of our practice as well. I mean, it's not about the money. So get a good idea and then they, they don't even are allowed to put money from their, from their wallet. They have to seek for the resources, do some fundraising within the school, get all the resources together and then finally execute these projects, which builds a, a very important competency about how you achieve and promote these ideas, these projects. This one is, uh, I really, I'm, I'm very, we did this in 2012, I feel very connected with this project because we work it with Techo Para Mi País. They used to have this community center that was fully closed and they work along with the community to open it up and with the same methodologies and, and I think it resumes a little bit that architecture is a great excuse to build human relationships. And I mean, we, we are part of this, and we have learned skills and we have part of this profession that is truly a very powerful excuse to improve lives, as Anna Hedinger may say as well. So uh, I, I think that's, that's very beautiful about our, our way as whole of all of us that we can achieve and do. Most of the projects we, we is a design and make studio. So we build it up, we implement it, we construct trust we don't go from just merely academic simulations and speculations. This is something I'm really critical in different schools that, I mean, sometimes you do these option studios, like for example, in the GSD. And um, 
they go to China or India or Africa or Latin America. They spend five days, they come back, and then they propose something. Uh, that's quite silly. I mean, you really need to get on board and embark in a long-term relationship. Uh, even from the tutor's point of view. So you have to construct construct trust. That's, that's a very important part. Uh, and this is not merely academic simulations there or speculations. This is also trying to do a step-by-step -step following up um, projects and with the users, with our clients, because they really matter. We're speaking about people. Uh, and if you get the people on board, they will be engaged and every single part is relevant within this collective transformation of the spaces. In this case, we, we did a paint intervention with some houses because the, the families, they told us we wanted to, to implement a little bit 50 houses and we thought all together that we were, this was the best possible solution and most affordable. We did it, everybody was on board, part of this intervention. We enjoy it a lot. Uh, we invest as much as time as possible to get everybody on board, to listen to their ideas, to present these ideas to potential donators, donors, to get the funding to build it up. Uh, and for example, in our university, they used to make like an exhibition of all the studios. And our studio stand was the crappiest one because we didn't have a project, it was only like these very cheesy wooden images and stuff like that because the project was built on the parking garage of the school and then it was implemented on site. So sometimes I think it's, I mean, it's good to make simulations, it's good to speculate with forms and 3D printing and these amazing ideas, but also sometimes it's good to invest all these resources in something that also can have a, a, a real impact on real people. So we need to find a balance, I think, within academia to get everybody on board in this transformative experience. And there is a lot of stigmas with these communities. Uh, because the sensationalist press up for consumption. They say it is the worst place, but this is the treatment we have. It, it's amazing. I mean, I, the first time I stepped in an informal settlement was in 2004, and it was truly a transformative experience for me um, because of the quality of the people, and there's a lot of stigmas and a lot of preconceptions and misconceptions about uh, what really means poverty, which is a very silly and stupid way of thinking about these communities. Uh, it's about speaking more about life quality, probably. Uh, a good, uh, finally, uh, oh well, this is a, a great thing. When, when you ask to the little ones, the, the kids, they are really uh, part of these uh, processes. And when you ask a little kid, what do you want to do when you grow up, when you start a project? They tell you, eh, maybe I want to be a reggaeton singer with a suspicious mind, or, or I want to be like a soccer player, like Keylor Navas or Cristiano Ronaldo, right? And then after the experience, you ask the same question and they look more suspicious, like, well, oh, maybe like an architect or engineer, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's not that we want to, to bring them to the dark side of the force, <laughs> but I think that the, the really important fact about this is that they truly understand that we are there, we are available. We are not a luxury. We provide a service. We are part of a society. We are architects. We are there. And, and that's very important because for some people, they don't really know what, what is architecture about. Uh, we got invited to, to give a, a lecture in the Buenos Aires Binali, and there was a um, uh, Bjarg Ingels, we, we, he was presenting bef after us, and we were talking about this particular issue that most of the society, they don't really understand what does the architects do? They really don't know. They really don't know what we do. It's, it's quite silly. And we need to find ways of communicating and build up an adequate narrative to make clear what we do. Because otherwise, we're going to just move in our own bubbles. And sometimes it's overwhelming when you go to different schools and see all these amazing exhibitions and invest on resources and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. But do you really get what is our profession about? Probably the best way to test that is to bring your, I don't know, your mother or your family families and bring them to the exhibition and see if they understand it. Otherwise, it's just uh, over-intellectualized discourses of our practice with any consequence at all. So, and with our students, we try to at least work with this, work and build projects with the same methodologies, get the people on board, try to, to find the adequate language to communicate and to articulate and to construct. And you can have a lot of building lessons on site as well. Uh, I'm surprised, sometimes the students, they don't even know how to use a hammer. 
uh, which is that's that's crazy but it has happened to us not how to use a hammer I mean that's that's crazy and uh, uh, some of these interventions they quite feel proud because they have done it with the community and probably is the first build project so there is a lot of proudness about these type of interventions and this is not oh, this is very important this is no false sense of philanthropy I mean I'm not talking about saving the world and be the best person ever blah, blah, blah. I'm not talking about that I'm what I'm trying to to tell you is that if you go to informal settlement or or low-income families communities they don't want anything from you they just want an opportunity as most of us have had in this place so it's about building opportunities together which really matters in that sense uh, and finally finally but not later uh, there was this project in La Carpio we worked with very small interventions in terms of these prototypes. There was some uh, families that they have uh, in their community, in the members, in their family members, they have some uh, physical disadvantages. And in that case, we work, uh, the students, they work and develop in this um, retractable bed uh, with recycled materials because of the, uh, of the aim and the way that they can solve in, in order to address the resources to, to build these projects and this share, for example, and, and also this one, this the deployable share that the, this little young one needed. And this is my last image. And I want to close with this one because this truly shows with the, the, with the small scale, there is a big change. This young one, he was oxygen dependent. So she has to go to her school and move around with this tank, oxygen tank, every day. So the students, they find out about this condition and they, they designed this scooter. So this little girl, she, she was very alienated from all the community. And when she got the scooter and put the tank on the scooter, she became from being the more alienated girl to be the coolest girl in the neighborhood. So she, she was like very cool and she got some Hello Kitty um, stickers and put it in the tank. So I think my, my associate, he lo always loved to talk about this uh, example because it truly brings out uh, brings up the life quality, not for the young one, but for the family members, for the community itself. So everything, everything matters. And Pura Vida, uh, it's, it's so great to be, to be here, back here, and thank you all, and thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for this presentation, very inspiring, very lively, and also quite sobering. We, we have a few minutes for two or three questions. Anyone? Thank you for your presentation. Maybe that's a bit too loud. So you asked some questions to me, and now it's my turn. <laughs> it's like, it's like, that's why it was a bit soft, right? <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I, I just finished SED myself, and here we have quite a few students. So I think it's very inspiring to see someone who finished this program 10 years ago um, actually being out there and doing things and achieving things and somehow implementing, because in somehow each of your projects, it was visible that this thing is in the back of your head and you're designing with it and you're thinking about it and uh, and it gets built and it works so that's really nice to see um, and it was also nice to see how you went with this timeline and the projects kind of uh, became more and more sophisticated along the way and I'm sure other people observed it as well that there is a sense of maturity that goes along with this process and yeah, so congratulations to this. The only question I have uh, is that mostly you, you showed public functions, things that improve uh, life quality of communities. Uh, however, I'm not sure how they work as a business model. Therefore, I think you, you, you had found raised from municipalities, as you, you mentioned in one project, yep. but what it seems so effortless that you go there, there is this problem, and then you build something, but then it costs money. So who, 
who is typically the one investing into it. These communities don't have money, I guess. Munip municipalities sometimes do, sometimes don't. Do you do crowdfunding? How do you fund these yep. projects? I think that's that's a very important question, and especially in this year in, in Harvard, that's one of the great greatest discussions we're having because it's how to sustain a practice itself. It's not even about the specific project, but how you achieve to have the funding and the resources to have a team and work together. And one of the key aspects we have learned in the past 15 years is when you go to a community, the best thing you can do is first to understand who are the, the stakeholders on site? Who are the NGOs? Who are the foundations? Who are the public and private enterprises? And knock the door over there and say, how can I help? Because probably they have done a lot of work and they are capable of doing it because they have anthropologists, sociologists, they have all these people, knowledgeable people that know how to do this. And then we as designers, we can show up and help them to develop a design process. And if that's clear articulated, the way of getting funding is not that hard because you're, you are being part of a team. It's not the res your responsibility itself to get the funding. But in the other side, um, what we're discussing right now, for example, in, in Harvard, is about this concept that I learned from Paul Nakazawa, which is called the Catalyst Fund. When you develop a nonprofit a Catalyst Fund, uh, how you, how, first of all, if you have an organization, like a design organization, you want to be non-profit, what are the core values that will make people to invest and to put resources to your initiative? And how these funds are gonna be articulated to different projects, and how you can ensure that this money is transparent, is gonna be well executed, and then you're gonna have feedback and the community is, being, is playing an important part and role along these processes. So I think the most important part is not about the funding, it's about the structure you build up and the network. And this structure is more related with having the values very clear and articulated, very three very important values. Uh, and then what are the, the, the elements, the methodologies, the, the tools that you develop in order to have transparency and to articulate the different stakeholders with, within the project. I know I'm giving like a very abstract open answer, uh, but for example, I, I am very inspired lately by, you know, mass design. I told Simos and Jorge about this practice in Boston. I think they're quite clever. They have done it very well in the last years in terms of the business model. But I think the social business, the social entrepreneurship is the way to go. Uh, and I think I truly believe more in a hybrid model, n not just nonprofit. We can really live from this. I mean, we have done it in our case. And the symposium we're organizing in GSD in January the 30, 29th and the 30th, you're more, more than invited to come over into Boston, is gonna be where we're gonna be talking about this. And we're inviting other collectives from Latin America to share their experiences in that sense. Um, you talk about uh, constructing trust, um, and I have a couple of questions. The first one is, do you always use the, the, the help of an NGO or somebody that already gained their trust in, in some way and then can introduce you to the community? Or have you had a, a project where you had to build that from scratch? And then the second one is, once you do that, how, how long do you really have before uh, you can pitch and and uh, to the to the community uh, before you really lose that trust. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very important. We have done, we have tried at the beginning, do it by ourselves, and to be honest, it was a mess. We managed to do a couple of good examples, mostly oriented with uh, academic experience with our students. When we go from scratch, from zero to the community, I wouldn't recommend it at all. Actually, it's even dangerous. Because, I mean, you don't go, it's not because of an informal settlement. I mean, you don't go to any community, wealthy or not wealthy, and just go show up and hey, no. I mean, it, it, there is something that is common sense that is very important to acknowledge that there is people that they really know how to do this. And we as architects and designers, 
we it's good to to understand that we don't have the skills we can learn from these skills from other professions and we have to acknowledge a multi multidisciplinary way of working and thinking transdisciplinary way of working and thinking uh, by itself and then to answer that what we do and what i recommend is not uh, just work with people that has done that they have the fertile field already so we can as designers we can help in in that sense that that's at least our point of view in our practice and then uh, in terms of building trust the, i think the most important part is to be coherent um, step by step uh, we have learned that very little actions uh, at the very beginning they help you to build up a relationship so for example i'm going back and tomorrow and tomorrow i'm teaching a participatory design workshop in, in harvard and we're working with a cambodian refugee community in boston and it's going to be our initial contact and we already went to the community and what we're going to do is work a, a very small intervention within a basement we're just going to probably paint it and do some a little workshop along the basement to make it a, a better place but of course there are going to be more powerful questions about how to implement and get the community center better and retrofit it. But you, you need to encompass, you need to have a sequence. Uh, in, in MIT, there is this great professor, his name is Bish Sanjal, and I was, as an auditor, I was taking a class that is called Challenging Urban Informality. And Bish, I think he's very keen about this part of sequencing, about what are the steps to follow as a strategy. I, th I think the key of this is sequencing and trust is a, is a coherent and collateral part, a very important part of, of this strategic way of thinking and working. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Hi, Mike. Um, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, back in Mexico, I've worked with some communities in similar projects, and I think one of the most challenging uh, situations is, as you said, the post-occupancy maintenance and feedback, that usually when the NGO arrives to the place and makes these beautiful projects and everything, and they once they leave, these projects tend to be abandoned or um, transformed in other things. In your experience, what you have seen that is the best solution? I mean, to leave, uh, leave it in hands of the NGO or to have like in the community someone that take care of this place or what you can recommend about these situations? You, you say it, I think it's uh, a community empowerment. So, I mean, we have worked with different type of NGOs and to, that's my point of view. I, I'm, I don't trust that much NGOs at all. I think they're, they're just inventing business for themselves and to support something for a little amount of time and then move forward. They're like, a, uh, they have this post-colonial <laughs> way of thinking, I don't know. Not, not all of them, I don't want to generalize, but uh, <laughs> but, but I, I don't know. I don't, I, there is something about the NGOs that is just drive me crazy. I think uh, some of them, they have done good work and, uh, and in our experience, it's more oriented and related in building community capacities stakeholders and having the community leaders always on involved on charge because they are the ones the project is for them they, it belongs to them and uh, we have to put the user on the center of this the user and the environment in the center of these discussions and if, if we don't manage to do that i mean we it's a failure i mean if you if you don't get your clients to be proud and, and when i say clients i'm talking about the people to be proud about the project and they feel that this belongs to them we're failing truly we're failing because we're not idealizing the way of how people live is i mean we're talking about human beings and the experience about living within the built environment so we are just facilitators we provide a service but we have to ensure that we are having this in that sense, humanistic way of thinking and and connecting people with the built environment. That's that's critical. So to, I just want to, to highlight the last thing you said is on that community. We need to ensure that the people really is embedded and is grassrooted in the project. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so my question pretty much follows on those two, and it's also from having uh, worked in Cape Town and with CS Studio, um, and so there's been like a long tenure history of working with government as well as NGOs, but actually mostly government. So yeah, like we, we just spoke about the down, both the pros and the cons of the NGO, we also experience this sort of projection or post-colonialist <laughs> ideas that arrive, as well as um, the problems within government and change in government or lack of change in government. So what results is like often a lot of senses they keep living forever and they're amazing, and then other ones, in the same way that an acupuncture needle um, is very potent when it, it hits the ground, it, it needs to be relived in that same mapping and participation and weaving in of people and stakeholders sometimes needs to be revived, it feels, and and a thread rewoven. And so I found it very interesting how now you're starting to take over these, well, yeah, like mapping larger areas and being able to infiltrate now in multiple groups of buildings, as opposed to the beginning where it was in more individual. So there's clustering and mapping and routing, which is also incredibly powerfully spatially and for the community. So I just wondered, um, reflecting back on your 10 years, um, uh, I was just, yeah, I was also wondering how you feeling again about this bringing public and private together, um, if there's any other ideas there, and then also of those buildings that you said in where there's the patina there, so there's this layering, but also have you been able to, to come back or have groups themselves reinvented spaces and started to translate like, yeah, very organically and created that? Because there's always that, like, you know, like I said, that, that Buddhist, so just how there is and then what the potential is then within that you found in your recent kind of clustering and actually what I'm quite interested also is in the in-between spaces, the kind of performative, mm. there's a very performative aspect to the buildings besides being functional, they're very performative in the way that they're playful, they're engaging, their spatial performance on multiple levels that's kind of occurring. So I was just wondering, that thread of the humanity and that participation, essentially a feedback loop, how that could sustain within this clustering now and within the various relationships of the institutes and the people, how right. you could see that merging. Right, well, that's, 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 that's something. Uh, Simos, we got a PhD project now. We can work together. <laughs> No, no, but I truly understand your point, and I, I, I think I'm gonna attempt to summarize it in a very simple, with a very simple idea or concept, which is politics. I, I think we have to be engaged with politics. We are not architects, we are citizens. And then afterwards we can think about being architects. And being politics, involved with politics is because we care, we're members of the polity, of the city, what really means politics. It's a shame because, I mean, with Bolsonaro, and I'm sorry if somebody's with Bolsonaro support him, but with all these wicked presidents we are having er everywhere, I mean, you, you can tell that people, they, everybody thinks that that's politics. That uh, We think that these poorly politicians, these corrupt politicians, they really represent the side gaze, the spirit of the era, they don't. And there is a lot of great examples of activists and people that is raising their voices and doing amazing stuff, amazing work, and truly to be members of the polity, to be in citizens, it is extremely related with architecture itself because we are aware and care about the public and the private effort and spaces. So it, in that sense, I, I don't think I have the solution, but I, I think we, we need to be part of the discussions and we need to get involved and knock doors in all the uh, apparatus with, within the city. I, I think that's, that's very important. We are doing that back home. Uh, we have gained some trust from different local authorities with different political parties and colors. So they know we're, we're, we're apolitical, but we care about our city. And, um, and we don't care if it's right, left, we just wanted to work together and try to make this better place for everybody uh, and build opportunities together. So I, I think uh, people is tired about what I'm doing right now, speaking and speaking and speaking. <laughs> but uh, I think people is more keen about seeing actions 
and that's why the activist part is, is, is very important and very precise actions, they don't mean that we have to build a building, we, we have to be intentional about our role in the places and the spaces we live. That's our first approach. I think the AA has a lot of great examples in the 70s, 60s about these conditions and we're not invent reinventing the wheel for sure. Um, so I think this is a, a, the answer has to be with another discussion and another table of speaking about architects and politics. I truly recommend you Saida Muxi and, and Montaner. Uh, I don't know if you know them, uh, Saida Muxi and Josep Maria Montaner, they have, this book is called Arquitectura y Politica, Architecture and Politics. And Saida Muxi, she's an amazing architect activist that she's trying to, to get the role of women in design very well centered because it's a shame how women has been just banished from the history of architecture and design and they play a very important role and they're just, their names are not there. So they, these, these terrific architects in Latin America, they're, they're working, she's working on, on raising up these issues and showing evidence about the, the importance about women in design and architecture. And when we speak about this, we're speaking about the, the, the necessity of a social comprehension of our field, of our practice. And, and something that drives me crazy a little bit in the States, I mean, I've been in the States quite a few times. I, I, I'm, I'm there, I'm living right now there, I'm working in, the, in Harvard, but it drives me crazy how we still talking ab about people in terms of, of colors. I mean, that's insane. It's 2019 and we're still speaking about brown, black, and, and white, and uh, that, that's crazy. And, and it's part of the same discussions of gender and, 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 and colors. I mean, we have to move forward, and, but we have to be very sensitive and very intentional about this, about these emerging voices, and how we provide and we bring these discussions into the, the schools and into the city more important rather than the schools into the city because the schools sometimes they are bubbles and I, 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 it's very frustrating sometimes in, in, in amazing environments like Harvard or MIT that they have both. Sometimes there is a, a very intentional way to, to permeate everything but in other places they are, they are silos and they don't, they, that doesn't make any sense at all. Sorry about the long answer that I have. But it's politics, politics is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? No, no, I'll, 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 how, how do you feel your buildings are platforms for those voices? Then? Oh. If it's captured, yeah, I, I think um, that what we have learned and what I learned from the, my thesis project back in Costa Rica to be an architect is that, as you see, some of these communities, they don't have spaces to gather, to get together. And that's the first part of the sequence is to provide adequate, not, not Sorry about the word, it's not provide. It's to generate collectively and a space together. That doesn't have to be a building. It could be a, a temporary place or infrastructure just to get together and rethink the environment and have discussions. But sometimes the communities don't even have this space or this opportunity. So I think our projects, I truly believe they, they reinforce this part. They don't generate it because it's like we're imposing something. No, they reinforce and they, they help to provide and to work along with these spaces. Yeah. Okay, and on this note, thank you once again, Mike, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, good night.